Okay. No, any class is fine. I'm just waiting for another minute or two. Yeah. The question is, um, are we allowed to use the Java libraries for heap or the Swift libraries for heap? Or You're not allowed to use a built-in heap. Um, you also don't want to be doing sort of, let's see if I can somehow hack away a sorted solution, um, doing some weird things. The, the goal here is to give you a small problem to work on um, that has some design issues in it. Um, and if you start using the built-in libraries, then I need to give you large problems to work on with design issues in it. Um, Correct. So the question is, if we're using the heat, then we need to have, the, does everyone understand the heat, how heat works? At least some people are willing to say yes, other people are like, well, I think I heard the word in Data Structures course years ago, um, but there is this bubble down, this bubble up, right? Um, the question is, where do those operations go, right? Now, figuring that out is part of the assignment. <laughs> right? That's why I don't want you to use the built-in libraries, right? That becomes one of the design questions of where do those, those functions go and why? What's the answer? So that's your answer, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Um, are you saying, can I use a link list? Or you can use an array list, yeah. You just have to implement the bubble up and bubble down, right? And have to go someplace and. Um, to say it's more efficient, depends what you mean. At, at runtime, the array is going to be more efficient. Um, It does it does a growing for you. Any other questions? Okay. 
But we didn't have to ask what's the difference between a list and a linked list, right? In some languages, a list just means a mutable array. Right, and using a link list to a heap, um, the problem there is the operations become more expensive, right? In fact, they become linear. Any other questions? There are a few people asking about the videos. Um, it took longer than it should have. Um, YouTube, I, I now use YouTube to host the videos. And my idea was that there should be a YouTube channel for each course because they're separate courses and not related. Um, Google has a different idea. Um, they make it hard to do that because to, to post a large video, um, you have to verify your account for that particular channel. And to do that, you need a cell phone number. And they only allow you to a particular number to verify so many accounts to channels. And I ran out of phone numbers to give them. And so I spent some time struggling with them and deleting everything I had before, hoping that would free up the phone number so I could use it again. And yeah, that's what I'm doing. It's just have one channel and just put everything there. And but I had ran out of phone numbers, so I had to figure out how to get past that. So it's that problem solved. So what don't textbooks tell you? Yeah, right? Right. And what do they say that are the causes of the bad software? Well, actually, the big ball mud had different reasons than the um, what the textbooks don't tell you. They said that in the textbooks they don't tell you that one of the biggest problems Yeah, so he, he said basically there are some programmers who, who are too good, right? And they come up with these complicated solutions. Um, he also said there are some programmers who aren't very good and they also come up with bad solutions, right? Yeah. Solution. Yeah, and that's that is a comp that is a common reaction, right? We 
come across a problem like, oh, I can use this. That'd be good, right? Um, and what happens in this case, in this case, in this case, right? So we start building more complex things than you actually will need. Um, it's a very tempting, and I suspect everyone in this room has done it, right? Um, what does they say is a simple fix? What's that? But that that wasn't his solution. Yeah. No, not that that was not his solution. Yeah, his solution was better commenting, right? When in doubt, comment. Um, so what is the big ball of mud? its original structure as good or bad as that may have been and yeah and it eventually just becomes this like big ugly thing that's almost impossible to so, so the, the best example I know is um, there was this commercial piece of software that was produced by a company in San Diego, who, which will remain unnamed, um, where the main function was 10,000 lines of code. Um, it was so bad that no one except the original author could touch it. Every attempt they made to do anything to that function. You know, let's take this piece out and remove it and then call it. It would it would break something. It literally, no one could touch it. If it, if it did anything to it, something would break. And the only solution was you start all over again. Um, yes, but the person I knew who took over as head engineer would, as soon as possible, have fired that person. As soon as they were able to um, get on, it would get, no, you mean you're gone because you just cost the company too much money on having to rewrite this. At the same time, you have to maintain both branches, right? Um, How many people here at work have dealt with a 
big ball of mud. Yeah. It, Right, yes. Yeah. Lack, yeah, lack of time. Yeah. Or, or problem right. So the paper is slightly confusing in a sense of it's called the big ball of mud. And they talk about the big ball of mud in the beginning, and then they list the patterns, right? And one of the patterns is the big ball of mud. It's like, well, what? Um, right? And so, each of the patterns has this format right there's some sort of goal and what you do right and they talk about the forces that lead you to this problem um right and so that it's basically you know someone's paying for this and you've got a budget and you need to there's a deadline and a budget and so you And if you've worked on, if you've worked professionally writing software, you come across this all the time, right? You've got deadlines and often you can't hire all the people you want, or you can't get the resources you want, right? Um, does anyone know the term death march? You, yeah, and it, it's, not just this weekend, but it's next weekend and the week, every weekend until the deadline, right? Yeah, where the, you know, the problem is we have this deadline and, oh, you're behind schedule. And so just, just work 70 hours a week for the next six weeks, right? You're salaried, yeah. You're not an hourly person. You're you're, you're professional. Sorry, but that's um that's what happens, right? Um, and so when you do that, you just you write the code, you slap it together, and it's one thing when you're young and you work sixty hours a week for one week, you can do it, right? Doing it for three weeks in a row? No, it doesn't work. I mean, you may be there physically, but you're like, oh, I need to make a dentist appointment. Let me do that. Well, no one's looking. And you start spacing out and you just do not, just, you're not productive. No, no, no. Yep, move on. Yep, yep. Um, you know, it talks about top-down design, right? Um, but the later on, it talks about the problem with top-down design, right? It, it takes a long time to come up with a design, and the problem you now things change fast these days, and so by the time you get the design, you're halfway done, 
Like, oh, like competitors got something different, so we need to modify. Now what do we do, right? Um, hire good architects, well, they can be expensive, hard to find. Well, give an example, well, it's okay, so we wanna build the system, right? Um, so what do you do? Um, do you start hacking code right away? No, first of all, what are the requirements? What do we need to do, right? Make sure we understand what we need to do. Then we got that. Okay, how are we going to architect it, right? So we start building, writing down the structure of it. You know, we need these modules, this module, and this module. And what do all the modules need to do? Okay, these modules need to do this, this, and this. And we've got that. We say, okay, now this module, we're going to need these classes. This module, we need these classes. There's another thing in React. And we write all this down. And so you get this big design which says, you know, we're going to have five modules. Here's the modules. Here's each module we're going to do. Here are all the classes we're going to need for each module. Here's the functionality of those classes, right? Um, here's how they're going to react, right? And now you can start implementing, right? Yeah, bottom up is okay. Well, let's. Um, yeah, so the extreme programming people talk about, you know, you want you want to start with something that works, right? St having a blank sheet of paper is so rare. And so, what's the smallest program you can write that satisfies one of your requirements? Okay, maybe it just shows a single menu with a single item that does that one thing, right? But it's working. And now, what's the next feature you want to add? Okay, we add that feature, right? So one of the common next three things is you list all, you basically have what they call stories or requirements, right? And then you rank them, and then you take your first one, and you make it work. And then when you're done, you take the second one, priority and you, you add that right so you're you're slowly building up yeah yeah piecemeal design right um Yeah, so here are some of the problem, some of the symptoms of big mom mud, right? And uh, the first time I talked about last time, right? Um, this is actually a hard one, right? Um, the way I visualize it is, you know, we're good at dealing with things, and so we build things bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And as it gets bigger and bigger, it's harder to maintain, right? But eventually it gets big enough, it's like, I can't hold any, it's too big, and I'm just struggling to maintain where I'm at, right? And the problem is we have to learn not to go that far, right? If we keep it smaller, now we can. We've got the ability to change and modify this small thing, but when it gets this complicated and this involved, um, you're dead, right? And then you say, I'll just add more people to help me, but again, you do the same thing, and then you got three people who are just struggling like this, you get stuck, right? And I assume you've, you've, you've probably seen that, where it gets things are so complicated, it's hard to understand, the team just slows way down, because it's like, oh, now we need to modify, change this section, but after, we have to understand it, right? We don't understand it, so you spend a lot of time trying to figure it out and poking and prodding to make sure you understand it, and then you make a change. Like this 10,000 line main, like, are we gonna make modify this, and we have to understand it, and you pro it breaks, it breaks, it breaks, and it just takes forever to then make that change so that something doesn't break. 
And the problem, of course, the guy with the 10,000 main, he was a, he was like a muscle muscle man, right? So he, he could like, no problem, I can handle this. But everyone else was like, man, we haven't lived in that waste that long, and they just couldn't do it, right? And so one of the things we have to learn as engineers is not to build the most complicated thing, right? How do we build smaller things and use those building blocks in such a way that we can understand the building block and right how it all work together? Um, so what are the three ways of dealing with a big ball of mud? Yeah, so he talks about basically refactoring it, right? Um, yeah, and there's actually a, um, another person, like Feathers has a book out on, you know, what do you do, how do you deal with um, legacy software? Right. How do you actually do that with like a lease software? How do you, you you walk into a project and it's you know it's been going for ten years and it's a big mall mud. Now what do you do? Right. And this whole book on steps to take and how you can handle that, as opposed to here he just says, well, just refactor it. It's one of them, right? But what, what's one of the other ways? Yeah, you throw it away and start it over again, right? Does anyone remember Netscape? Yeah. And how was it that you know, at one point Netscape was one of the leading browsers, right? And then what happened? No. Yeah, and they said, okay, we've got a big ball of mud, and so we're going to rewrite it. And the problem was, so the existing product was waiting for them to rewrite everything. In the meantime, Microsoft, um, it, they were, I mean, they were neck to neck with Internet Explorer, and then they stopped adding new features because they went for complete rewrite where Microsoft said, we're not going to stop. And before I knew it, I mean, Netscape was, it was gone, right? Everyone stopped using it. It was like, well, and it took Firefox a long time to regain that ground, right? And they're really not there yet. I mean, I think the browser share is like 80% Chrome, 10%. Firefox, ten percent, or somewhere on there. Yeah. Internet Explorer, Chrome, and then everybody else. Yeah, I mean they just. Well, yeah, <laughs> but but yeah, I mean so basically, right? The problem with rewriting is how do you keep it? If your market is slow, um, you know maybe you're dealing with software that contain deals with container ships, right? You may not have too much competition, and so you can probably maintain an old version and then rewrite it. But you know, if you're in a competitive market, you basically kill. You're dead, right? Because you can't go forward with the current one and to rewrite it. 
Um, and the third one is just, well, you just live with it, right? You just, you live with the pain. Um, so he also talked about extreme programming. Um, extreme programming was the first methodology under the agile development. Um, and it was sexy when they wrote their, the paper. Um, the people who wrote the paper really didn't have an experience extreme programming at that point. Um, I know because I went, I was there for a couple of years and talked to them. And like, sounds good, but you know, uh, at that point they, they didn't have any experience with it. Um, and so extreme programming had various practices that they used. Um, talked about one was pair programming, um, where in, instead of sitting down by yourself and keep computer, there was two of you and you work together. Um, the idea being that, you know, two minds are better than one. Um, and, you know, plus it means that it, it's harder to write bad code when someone's watching you, right? I mean, it's also harder to make, mis I mean, it, with someone watching you, if you make a mistake, they're likely to, you know, more likely to see it than you, you will. It also means that more people understand the code. So when you're swapping around, the knowledge of how things work is shared. Um, I think called the planning game, where basically you broke things into um, small um, time frames, usually a month, and say, okay, what are we going to do this month? And you'd, and you'd again, you'd figure out what features are most important, um, how to break them down, and what can we achieve in this month? And then you would work for a month, and at the end of the month, you would see where you're at and then reprioritize things because you might realize that, oh, what we thought was important is no longer important. Um, Test-driven development, um, you wrote tests for everything to make sure that things actually worked. Um, you know, customer was part of the process. So the customer were like, okay, you know, what features are most important to us right now? Um, you know, refactoring, I mean, you write code and you step back and say, okay, is it, is our structure getting, uh, is our architecture getting a messy and it's time to refix it? Um, yeah, you know, small releases, you don't, don't do the Microsoft thing and say every two years you're going to release a new version of the software, right? Then work for two years with 10 programmers or 50 programmers working on it. Like, um, no, you're going to each month you release something and then maybe not to the world, but to your customer and they can play with it and see what's going on and give you feedback, right? Um, coding standards so that the yeah, quality was important. Um, it wasn't that, you know, he owned this module and you owned that module. No, the whole team. And so if he happened to use your module and saw something needed changing, he could have, he would just change it rather than. Um, and so this, you know, was there like 12 practices they talked about? Um, now, one of the things that happens is that. Extreme program became very popular. And so at one point, um, this is about 18 years ago, I talked to a graduate student who interviewed various places in San Francisco, and they're all claiming to do extreme programming. And he said, you know, they all claim they're doing extreme programming. And he would ask, you know, which one you're doing? And they're like, they're doing none of this. Um, earlier this summer, uh, Martin Fowler, who's a, a fairly famous author in the area, gave a talk at this Agile Development Conference, and he had several points. And he said, yeah, the 
First of all, he asked the audience, how many people are programmers? Hard anyone with programmers. They're all managers, et cetera. No programmers. Um, and he said that the problem now with agile development process is that most people are claiming to be agile development, but very few are. All right. Um, And that's one of the things that happens in this industry is things that get trendy. And then people, oh, that, yeah, that sounds good. And then we pretend to be doing that, um, not really think deeply about what that means and how to actually do it that way. Um, and one of the things they complained about was how agile as a team decides the process they should best use to, to, to fit the team members and the company and the culture, right? And to have um, a manager come and say, this is how we're going to do it. You know, we're going to use this agile process. It's not agile because agile means the team decides how they're going to operate. And as soon as someone comes in and says, you're going to do agile, it may not be the right fit for the team and that project. Um, So, you know, one of the patterns is throwaway code. And the idea is, what's that? Say that again. Yeah. Yeah, so years ago, I had a, a student who got a job at a local company, and it was sort of odd because he was a graduate student, and they assigned the project of writing a Cray emulator. It's like, that seems pretty ambitious to. Um, they said, fine, I'll do that. And he got so far in, and he realized, I'm not doing it the way it should be done. Right, so he went to his manager and said, "Look, you know, if you really want me to, I can push this through, but I made certain design decisions which are, I thought were good at the time, but aren't good, and it's going to bite us, right?" Um, so he asked the manager, "You know, can I just start over?" And the manager actually said, "Sure, go ahead, right?" Um, and so he actually was threw away what he was doing. And he used that knowledge he gained from that first attempt to, to better architect and design what they actually used, right? So that's a common thing, right? We don't, we have no idea how to do this. So, and we know we're going to screw it up. So just start and learn enough. So when you get to a certain point, you know, you know enough to really start, right? But to really start, you have to then throw it away. Right. In situations like that, where you do, where you throw away and start, is it um, common the second iteration of the project faster than the first, or are they like not at all? Are they not in Well, presumably, the whole point of the prototype was to learn, right? So. Um, whether it goes fast or not, it should be better designed. But um, there's a problem with doing this. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you pull this time and money into it, and you know, is your managing it allow you to throw it away? 
I mean, it's, it's running on my machine and it, it's half done, right? And so one way to solve that is to use a language or system that's slow enough that right you can implement things in it, but it becomes clear that it can't be shipped for production, right? But it's always that's always a hard sell to, to the management. Finding the manager says, okay, yeah, sure, you can throw this away and start over again. Um, it's a hard sell because it you know if you're a good engineer they're paying you a good salary right it seems like it might at least for particularly ambitious projects that doing a very beneficial economic Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the problem is, and I assume you've all experienced this, right? When you even when you're an assignment, it's like, I'm not sure how to do this, right? I don't know. And so you start thinking about it, and you learn more, and you write some code, and then you learn some more. And when you're finally almost done, it's like, finally, I know enough to actually understand what I'm supposed to do, right? Because writing software, there's so there's so many details you have to learn, and they're so nitpicky. And like this thing over here affects what happens over here, and it becomes it's hard to pull that into your head all at once, right? And it's not until you start, oh wait, this is not going to work because this piece has to talk to this piece, and the architect said it talks through here and here, but they have to talk like this, and you don't see that until you get down to the very, very fine details, and there's a million of them, and you can't, so it just takes a while to get there, right? And that's a problem with, and that's why, yeah, like I said, you know, doing a prototype to learn a lot of those details, and then restarting can be very beneficial. But it's expensive. And, you know, sure, Google has got plenty of money to do something like that, right? Um, Amazon and, you know, some of these big companies that got hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank um, have plenty of resources, but those companies, there's only a handful of those. Um You know, so as piecemeal growth is sort of like like the idea of not top down design, but you you build a small thing and you keep on adding to it. Um, now, of course, this is how you get a main which is ten thousand lines long, right? You start and it's, it's only 500 lines long and it works. And then we add this feature and then it's 700 lines long. Add another feature, right? This way you don't really, it doesn't seem to lend itself well to like considering how each of the new features can interact with the previous ones or be reconnected. Three months from now, you decide you want to add something. Yeah, so that that's why this last line is important, right? Well, you can you can always have a go to. Yeah, remember those? Yeah. Um, I, 
I did not see the source code myself, but the head engineer told me about it. And he, he definitely was not happy. They may sell a copy, yes. Although the engineer I knew at the company has moved on. Yeah. Um, Right. Right. So this this refactor, you know, is very important. It's what? Yeah, so there's, um, does everyone know what the waterfall method is? So basically, the waterfall method says there's various steps in design, right? So the first thing you need to do is get the requirements. What are the requirements for this project, right? Um, and you know, I forget, I think there's like seven steps, and I'm not going to remember them all, but then you, then, once you get the requirements, then you need to do design, right? Um, and once you've got the design, then you implement it, right? And then we get implementation, and then you do testing, right? Um, and so the sort of one idea is that then, you know, that you might have one team do all the requirements, they produce this big document, and they hand over the design team, the design team then produces a big document to hand over to the programmers. Um, and it was very bizarre because when Agile came out, people were complaining about the top-down design. And it turned out that everyone was referencing the original paper talked about top-down design. And then the son of the guy who wrote that paper said, you know, if you read the paper, my father said, this is a crazy idea which will never work. No one read the paper. They just saw the idea of top-down design, waterfall, like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, the problem is, if you've got one team doing requirements analysis, the next team doing design, they don't know anything. They have to read this document. But the document is so detailed and complicated. How do you read a 100-page document? So they have to start all over again, right? And then they hand this document over to the programmer. They're like, you want me to read this 200-page document? Are you crazy? Um, so they, have to, they then have to start all over again to figure out what the requirements are and, and figure out what design means. And the problem is then, of course, the design can't be complete because, it, you know, they got this nice picture. and. You know, says so this you talk to here, and at some point we're going to know this has to talk over there, but the picture doesn't allow it. So now what do we do? Um, and as the paper talks about, the problem now is software requirements change much faster these days, right? And so by the time you do this whole process, your design may be out of date. Even if we can do that right, and we can do a waterfall method, and you you finally produce a product. Um, there's going to be version two and version three and version four, right? And going from version one to version two is no longer the top-down part. It's it's piecemeal growth, right? Because you already have version one. And they said add these three features, so we eventually end up here anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, it can grow, right? I mean, the forces are yeah, opportunities are also well. I mean, we need version two, right? You know, Microsoft has to add no new features to Word so they can sell more, right? And so, we, we need the ability to.
Yeah, so currently, right, the, the solution is refactoring, right? Is that because as you start adding these pieces, the architecture starts to get wobbly, um, the code starts to look terrible, right? But you're just like, oh, this was designed for this, so I'll just glum it on here, right? Yeah, right. You know, the problem is, the dichotomy here is, when you're doing the waterfall method, the method forces discipline on you, right? You can't start design until the team is done doing the requirements. You can't start programming until the team is done doing design, right? So it, that forces um, structure, and so like, you don't have to be disciplined because you're like, okay, I can't start programming until they hand me the design document. Done, right? Um, here, what happens is when you say piecemeal growth and you're going to refactor, right, then the process does not force the structure on you, right? And that's what ha that's a one of the difficulties with agile processes is that if it's not top down, right, they don't, they say what you do is you, you know, list your features, you pick this one, we, we add it, and then we take this one, we add it. And, but but they also say you, you have to sit down and refactor, right? Which means you have to have the discipline personally and as a team, as a company, to do the refactoring, right? And that runs up against time and cost, right? Because like, okay, it's working, so we can go on the next thing because we wanna ship in three weeks, right? And then, okay, we will, you know, we're on a death march. We need to get this out, so we'll, we'll refactor later. Um, the, the problem with saying you'll do it later is that the longer you wait, the more difficult it gets. And so I do this, and I'm sure you do this, right? When you've got a task to do you like, you procrastinate, right? And there's this little cloud, like, oh, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this. And the longer you wait, the, the bigger the cloud gets, right? And the longer you wait to do the factory, and the cloud gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and at some point it gets too big. And like, you know, it's just too big. It's going to be terrible. And so no one wants to do it. And the, the manager doesn't want you to do it. Programmers don't want to do it. He's like, oh, my God, this is going to be terrible, right? Um, so it requires continuity on the programmer and the manager and the company, right? And the process does not enforce it the way Waterfall does, right? You say, okay, I can't do, I can't start programming until you hand me a design document. So we'll just do something else. And that's a, that's one of the things they, they talk about, right? Is piecemeal growth can lead to a big mull mud because you just add things. And that's one of the reasons why people say that, you know, teams that claim to be agile, and I say doing it, they're just, all they're doing is they're not doing design. They're just like, okay, we, we're doing piecemeal growth and they forget the refactoring part. Like, well, that just leads to this this big mess. Yeah. But, but at least you're, you take the time, right? If you take the time, then, okay, I mean, so it's, we also have to be practical, right? I mean, you may have to ship product, and so you may, like you say, build up this technical debt, and then, okay, but, you know, so we, we'll allow the debt to go so big, and then we'll take care of it. Um, 
And that's why they call it technical debt, is to remind you of, well, you know, yeah, you can. We don't mind charging some things on a credit card, but you know, we don't want to get that so big that we can never pay it off, and then get into this huge problem of, you know, spending all our time and money just paying off the interest on our credit card bill, right? Um, yeah, and the main main problem is we just. You don't refactor, you just add and add and add. Um, right, to keep it working as well, I mean. If the Nessie did it, it gets on, you know, we have to ship, so keep it working, right? Yeah, so that's that's a good point. And when you um, so later on, we'll look at some refactoring, right? But if you look at the refactoring book, and actually the second edition is going to come out later this year. Um, he shows you refactorings, right? And he shows you step by step, right? It, and it's always, he always starts with working code. It takes a very small step and you still got working code. It takes another small step, it's still working code, right? Still working code, still working code. I'm done refactoring. He does point out that, yeah, you, you may not want to always do it in these small little steps, but he continually points out the whole idea is you never do this, I'm going to change a code, and I do a bunch of stuff, and nothing's working, and I can't quite figure it out, right? The goal is, once that happens, you're taking two biggest steps, right? You've all done this, right? You And, and you intuitively know, if you've got a project doing in a class, right, and it's due last Friday of the semester, Thursday night, you don't make big changes, right? Because it'll break, and then you're like, oh no, now what do I do? And you stay up all night trying to find out how to get back to make it working. So one of the one of the things you need to practice and think about when you're refactoring is, I can take small, you know, this and this and this, right? And each step is like, okay, it's working. I made this minor change. It's probably factory, and now it's working again. It's working again, right? Um, you have something that's working. Oh yeah. You push it, you know, to work, like for example, get it. Right. And oh, it's broken. But I have this previous version that I can always. I'll go, go back, back to. to and start from there again, right, right. So it's I mean, literally version control and tests. Going back to the example of you've had a project due on Friday, right, and you're working on it Thursday night. You you have this, you're nervous, right? You've got this panic about it. Um, the two things you can do to bring back your blood pressure down, one is to have version control. Why? Because you can always, I broke it, I'm lost, I can go back to where I was. Right? Um, the other one, if you've got test suite to test it, you'll, you'll know sooner when things break, right? Because the problem is you may not know right away you broke something, right? Because if it's this project and you're working on this little piece, you may have broken something over here, but you don't know it, right? Because you're testing this, you just like run this, run this, oh, it works, it works, it works, it works, it works. And then 
In the morning, you realize, oh, it's broken. What did I do, right? Because this, you now finally get to this piece. If you got a set of tests, right, um, then when you broke this piece over here by picking this and run the test, you'll know right away, oh, I broke something over here. Right? Um, yeah, so that's a problem, right? Is how do we, um, Yeah, this pattern is a bit harder. And let me, I need to make one. Yeah. I need to do one, well, it's probably too late, let me. Yeah. This is actually um, looking at the rates of change is actually a good way of thinking about um, how to create some of your classes. Um, divide your software and something. If things change really frequently, they should go together as opposed to making things that go change frequently with things that change very slowly because you know you're going to modify that a lot in this one. Um, but I always can never come up with a good example when I need to. Um, yeah, so I. This one gets used a lot. Um, there's a lot of Fortran code out there, a lot of COBOL code out there, a lot of C code out there, and people are programming in Java or some other language, and so what you do is you wrap it up and just forget about it, and then you you write all the new code in Java, right? And it talks to C code and gets response back. And what's that? And you never touch. Um, but it, but it is a good way of you know taking this ball of mud and just encapsulating it, so you have to worry about it. And we we can build out new structures using it, but make this more usable than. Yeah. Yeah. Reconstruction is just, well, just rewrite it, right? Get big ball of mud, and so we'll start over again. Most people I talk to recommend you never do this. Um, what they recommend is basically you take a small piece of that big ball of mud and you make it reasonable, and then you take another small piece and, and do it that way because otherwise you end up like Netscape. Right? It's just too expensive to. Yeah, Fred Brooks is a um, famous computer person from a while back. He was the one that 
um, head engineer on the IBM 360 project, which was at that point the largest computer system ever built. Um, it's also one that basically doomed IBM. Um, the documentation for that system was, I think, as tall as Empire State Building. And after they finished the project, the leaders of IBM realized that they had bet the farm on this project succeeding and they didn't realize it. And that scared them because like, oh, what if we failed? I mean, we'd have been out of, basically out of business. But they, I mean, they literally um, put so much resources into it. Um, they were, were not willing to make big, um, take big chances again. And so they missed a lot of opportunities. But he was the one that ran that project, made it work. Um, and yeah, he basically says, yeah, I mean, you're gonna, I mean, if you build a big system, you're gonna, eventually you're gonna throw one away. You have no choice. But the problem is, it's one of these, these rules that work even if you, even if you plan on throwing it away, you end up throwing another one away, right? And these are the problems of trying to start over, right? It costs you too much money. It takes time. Um, and the problem is the people who wrote the original software probably aren't there anymore. And so they they had bugs, so they didn't realize certain features they had to go work certain ways. And so the new guys doing it all over again are probably going to make the same mistakes since they're going to introduce those bugs again. Um, and yeah. You'll release a, a product that has fewer features, but you can't. It took so long to right build the new product that. He's basically saying that, in my mind, software is so complicated and so detailed. It's very difficult to plan it out all in advance, right? It's like my student who built the simulator for the Cray is like, okay, um, the job was so complicated um, that there really wasn't a good way for him to design it well initially. He had to learn more about how the Cray, how he would do all this thing, right? And Part of that required him to build pieces so he could understand how it worked. And so he had to go so far to realize, oh no, I made a mistake. How do we, how do you know enough about this complicated system in advance to avoid all the problems? Sure, if, you, if you've been building banking systems all your life, and this is the 10th one you've done, right? Then when you start from scratch again, you're probably okay. But how often do you get to do that? You know, particularly if you're like, okay, in this industry, the best way to get a pay raise is to switch jobs, right? Um, So that's, you know, we like to talk about good design. And yeah, so two articles that talk about some of the things people don't like to talk about, right? It, um, software, always, software isn't what we always want it to be. Um, And if we don't recognize, we don't admit to our problems, then how can you possibly ever solve them, right? It just won't work. So um, Ken Beck is another one of these um, 
people who write about software is fairly influential. Um, his background is that he and um, Cunningham worked for a company called Textronics a long time ago, and they were what they called the firemen. And so when projects were in trouble, these two were sent in to fix it, right? Help fix the team. And that was just their primary jobs for many years. And as a result, they got to see lots and lots of problems. And then how do we fix it, right? More problems, how do we fix it? More problems, how do we fix it, right? And that gave them a good base to understanding software development because the more problems you see, the more where you solve them, the better off you are. Um, so he has these, these properties of good coding style. Um, do things once and only once. So if you if you see yourself doing the same thing in multiple places, then like how can we do it one place and then use that one place where it's needed. Um, and that one is sort of easy to observe because oh, I'm doing it the same. I'm doing the same thing. I got the same case statement in three places. Okay, what can we do to unify that in one spot? Um, lots of little pieces, right? The extreme of that is just 10,000 main, right? It's one big thing, and forget it. You, you can't reuse it. You can't modify it. Um, so having lots of little pieces. Um, replacing objects is okay, okay. We know we got a good system when I can take, I'm using that object that I can now replace with a different object and still make it work, right? Um, Moving objects is a little more complicated. Is okay, can I take that object from this project and move it to that other project? Um, and then combining rates of change, right? Um, so once and only once, right? So if we've got you know, methods doing the same logic or we've got Objects of the same methods, is, you know, we're not satisfying this rule. This is an easy one to deal with. Um, and the small little pieces make it easier to satisfy one. You know, you've got a thousand line piece of code or a hundred lines of piece of code. There's gonna be lots of things in there you're gonna need elsewhere, but you can't do it because they're embedded inside that. Um, Um, for those of you who like cartoons, some of you have probably come across Dilbert. Um, and so on Dilbert, right, there are certain characters. One is um, Wally, the guy who likes to avoid work. There's also the pointy-haired boss, right? Um, and so this is one with Wally explaining how he's going to get out of more work, right? Just being useless is not good enough. You have to be obnoxious so no one invites you to meetings. Um, so how does Wally fit in software development? Um, so rule number one is Wally never does work that he has. If he can pawn it off on someone else, right, he'll do that. He doesn't want to do any work. Um, and so that works in object oriented programming is, you know, here's an example of, you know, saying, oh, look, um, you know, I need to know, right, the bills is, right, I need those information, so don't worry, I'll go and I'll find all the bills and I'll do all this work, where there should be, no, 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 um, you know, just, just tell me, you know, you tell me, right? Um, instead of me doing all the work. Um, let's see, do we've got time? No, actually, I think I'll stop here. Um, and start here next time talking about you know, examples of how, how we can do this.